Grab your favorite caffeinated beverage and get cozy because you are listening to Mindful as a Mother with Paige Bruce and Lindsay Adams. Do you remember those toys from when we were kids where you would fit the different shaped pegs into the different shaped holes? Yeah. That's a lot like parenting, except when you have a neurodivergent child, using traditional parenting techniques is like trying to put the round peg in the star hole. That's exactly how I felt when I discovered that Sam was neurodivergent. I knew that traditional parenting techniques and even the approaches that I was taught in grad school, they didn't feel right in my soul to like supporting who he was as a human. And they also just weren't effective. And that's when I discovered the power of responsive parenting. Exactly. So if you are like us and are interested in tailoring responsive parenting techniques to your neurodivergent world, check out our Parenting Your Neurospicy video series. You can find it in our stand store at the link in the show notes. This podcast is not intended to be a substitute for therapy or the therapeutic relationship. And the information given in this podcast is purely for educational purposes and is not intended to replace the advice of a professional. I feel like I'm still activated. I am that totally still so activated <laughs> by, by that. We just watched uh, Welcome to Mindful as a Mother. We just watched the episode four of season two of The Traders, and we are we are up. We are ready. So this might be yeah. intense. We I'm are. Up. Are you Team Phaedra? Are one hundred percent. I want Phaedra to win. Absolutely. Yeah. Beyond a doubt. If you haven't yet, please check it out, Traders on Peacock, and then send us a message. The U.S. one. We love a housewife. Or the U.K. one. U.S. one? U.S. US. I've never watched the U.K. one, but I mean, I will now. Okay, so uh, my name's Lindsay. I'm here with Paige, and we are on Podcast Weekend. If you have not listened to part one of Differences in Parenting Styles, I highly encourage you to go back and take a listen to that. Just a quick recap. We talked about, uh, what did we talk about? how different parenting styles show up, Mm -hmm. what you can do if you have different parenting styles with your partner, and um, that no parenting style is 100% the best way to parent a neurodivergent child, and there are benefits to having different types of parenting as long as it's not abusive. Yeah, and you shared some personal details from your life about how you've navigated being in the same book of parenting as your husband, and myself too. Yeah. Yeah. It just is wild. And I think it's so, it's such a good reframe that you don't have to be on the same page, but it's okay to be in the same book. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And my name's Paige, so. (laughs) Paige. 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 Okay. So, um, some things that help to, oh, I even wrote in the outline, get on the same page, but maybe I need to change it to how to get in the same book. (laughs) Get in the same book. So how to get in the same book. Um, communicating often about what's coming up for your children, their needs, what's going on for them specifically in that moment and how you want to parent or approach that. Tim and I do this often. We check in, especially so lately school can't has been a thing for Sam. School has been very hard. So we've had usually every weeknight we have a conversation about how we think Sam's doing, what's going on, how we want to approach the morning Mm -hmm. shifts and adjustments we want to make. And it's really helpful because then I feel like I hear his perspective, especially because there's like a chunk of time in the morning where I'm at the gym usually. Yeah. That I'm missing. But then I also have a chance to share why I what I think is going on for Sam and what I think we can do to help support him. Can you share what school can'ts are? Yeah. So it's another word for school refusal. And I actually found it in one of the books that we're referencing this season. It's supporting autistic girls and gender diverse youth. And it the language shift comes because you want to operate from a perspective that your child is not refusing school. It is that something in their nervous system is going on and they can't. It is hard for them. And so, yeah. And so it helps even using that language in our house. Like instead of saying like Sam doesn't want to go to school, he's not going to school. Like Sam has the school cans helps like shift all of our perspectives from like, this is a behavior to this is, you know, there's something that we need to address and meet needs somewhere else so that he can go to school. Um, the most important piece of this, I think, is not having the in the moment communication in the middle of parenting decisions. And we touched on that a lot in the last episode. Right. And it doesn't have to look like an argument. It is as simple as those little interjections, I think, that are unsolicited from your partner. And you think you're being helpful. Yes. And you're really not. 
that that was for myself. That's just like a way to say it. You're that, really not. You're really That's not. How we need to hear it. So there you go. Yeah, you're really <laughs> not. We've been watching traders, so it's going to be, you know. Um, the next tip is to be united. So, and I think the communication piece is helpful so that when parenting is happening in the moment, we have a plan and we're a united front because people talk about kids being manipulative and listen, I don't believe at their core kids are manipulative, but I believe all humans are out here trying to figure out how to get what they feel like their needs are met. Mm -hmm. And so if there is, if the parents are not on the same page, it's going to create problems. Mm -hmm. Same book. Same book. We don't need to be on the same page. The next tip is to attend appointments together. I think this is so important, especially if you have, I mean, traditionally, um, there, if the mother is the default parent, and I know this isn't always the case, sometimes what will happen is the mom is the one attending like therapy and OT and talking to the teachers and all that. So she, and she maybe has a different perspective, but it can be really helpful for the other parent to take in that information as well so that they are getting the same information you are. And it's coming from someone that's not you. Yes. A neutral source. Yeah. And I run into this in both capacities. So like when I, I am often the default parent because my schedule allows for more flexibility than Zane's. Mm -hmm, so like I'm the one attending the parent teacher conferences, a lot of the doctor's appointments. But then what we do is I intentionally call him afterwards, like debrief. Mm -hmm. We do the same thing. Like what was discussed, kind of what our goals might be. And, and we do it over the phone a lot because we have opposing schedules with yeah. work. Mm -hmm. But if we can do it that night together, we do. But oftentimes I'm like way asleep. And then in a professional capacity, I run into this when I'm working with neurodivergent children in therapy, mm -hmm. where I'm having a, a parent session, come in, give me updates on the child, tell me kind of what's going on at home and some of their goals. Mm -hmm. And then I've heard that they're like, hey, I really want to schedule a time for, and this happens to be where the mom is the default parent, yeah. where my husband can come in too, because we're having a really hard time getting on the, in the same book of parenting mm -hmm. and I think it would be helpful to hear it from someone that's not me. Yes. And something I uh, have to praise Tim for publicly really fast is that I'm not very good at remembering to call because sometimes it's like, oh, I'm running from this appointment. Like our kids had dentist appointments the other day even. Mm -hmm. And he called me and was like, how was the dentist? And so like if you're not the default parent, like making an effort to like check in, even if it's a text or a phone call, to be aware of what's going on. Yeah. It, it definitely takes – a lot of work and awareness on both ends. The next one is invite them to read or listen to your favorite neuroaffirming podcasts and resources. Literally this one. Send them all our stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Shameless exactly. plug. We have online parenting classes. And I'm amazed. Um, a lot of the feedback we get is I bought this and me and my partner are going to watch it together. Or I've watched it and now my partner's going to watch it. Mm -hmm. And I think it's so nice to have some of the things explained to us in a way that, that is different from how we maybe would explain it. Because you're taking in, interpreting the information, and then explaining it in how you feel like it relates to your child. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it's good to just have the information presented, and they may have a different idea or different perspective that's helpful. I mean, it's even helpful for me to sit and talk with Paige, because Paige has different perspectives, and she's super sciencey and she can explain those things to me, whereas I'm not. <laughs> so send them our podcast, buy our stuff, send that. Um, show them the why, don't do I told you so. So I think this comes from the, the low demand parenting book and you read her own story and her own like personal. What book is that? Can you share that with it's, so that I one? can't remember her name. We'll put it in the show notes and it's in the references. It's low demand parenting. I got it. Lean, lean by Amanda Dykeman, Dykeman. And chapter 11 is her co-parenting story. And this is re this was really, really helpful for me. This is what transformed like the way I approach parenting with Tim because it talks about demands and expectations we have in marriage or in parenting and specifically the demand that I need my partner to do things the way I do. Hmm. So the example she gives is I need them to do dinner the way I do. And then you figure out the why. Why is it important that they do dinner that way? Because I feel like... Um, they, I want things to go smoothly and I'm burned out by the end of the day or that. And then you figure out the need, like I need the support or I need the validation in that. Mm, but I the other that. piece of it is like dropping demands with your spouse. So not 
having the demand or expectation that they handle things the same way or that they do things in a way that you do or that they change their parenting style at the speed you want them to. Mm. Because a lot of this shifting of parenting styles requires a lot of unpacking about our own childhood and how we were parented. And we can't rush that. And then another example she gives I really resonated with is like wanting to have the conversation about parenting right now because you feel like it needs to happen right now. This is me. Um, And that if your partner's not ready for that conversation, what you can do. So I highly suggest you check that out. Um, But part of it is like just showing up with your kid in the way that you want to. And they may see the differences in the relationship, in the level of stress in the home and how things are being worked through. And then they're more likely to buy into it rather than constantly giving unsolicited advice and saying, I told you so. So more or less like you model why you yeah. You do what you and you do. model it in your relationship with them. So they, they see what it feels like to have that kind of connected understanding and compassion. Mm-hmm. And so they get why it feels, why it's important in parenting. Okay. Cool. Yeah. It's very good. Have you gotten to that part yet? Mm-mm. Oh, it's, um, I'm someone who places a lot of demands from like a control perspective, I feel like. Um, so... It was good for me because it made me more aware of the unconscious demands that I was placing on Tim. Do you know what some of those are? To parent the same way that I would parent or to because I <laughs> because I'm a therapist and I like that have made this my whole life. Like my <laughs> special interest this is, is my whole personality has been to dig into like responsive parenting neurodivergent children that he should just like accept what I say is like Bible and go with it. Yeah. (laughs) And then I realized like, oh shit, he gets to have a a perspective and opinion too. So based on the the feedback you're gathering about yourself and from the book, how have you been able to effectively drop those demands that you're placing on him? So it's a lot of like the expectation. So sometimes if I feel a strong feeling come up in myself when he's parenting, or this is even with like chores, sounds so weird but like Hmm. expecting him to okay so we're out of town this weekend yeah and in the past I would have expect him to do things like the way I would do them at home as far as like um what to feed the kids what time to put them to bed I would be calling and checking in are they in bed yet what's going on and a lot of that is like I'm not going to place that demand on him I'm just going to let him parent how he parents and trust that like he'll he'll figure it out Yeah, it sounds like such a simple concept. And I know you said that this probably sounds weird, but I think that it's actually really common Mm -hmm. because I run into a a lot in my work and then in my own life. Like I hadn't obviously read that portion of the book yet, um, but that's something that I consciously am aware of. Mm -hmm. Like when I am out of town, like I'm not not trying to micromanage. And a lot of the times I phrase it as like, you cannot micromanage your partner's relationship with your child Mm -hmm. you cannot design exactly what that looks like and I think sometimes where it comes from for from like my perspective is I feel like I'm codependent as shit and I'm really working on that but like I don't want Tim to feel stressed out because I'm out of town working and I have enough guilt about being out of town working so it's like I want to keep things as normal as possible I want to have things planned I want things to be like on schedule and to feel like I'm helping you know what I mean Mm -hmm. like I'm yeah and what I I'm not actually helping like it's not helpful yeah for him and for me and then it creates this unnecessary I set this expectation which is this is what dropping demands is I have this expectation like okay um I in the past would have an expectation that I come home and like Tim has done what I would have done yesterday in the house which means like getting laundry done you know getting the house all the things and I'm gonna show up and I guarantee he's gonna pick up when he sees on find my iPhone that I'm like 30 minutes away yeah. So it's not going to, there's not going to be any laundry done. And he's going to be like, oh yeah, I've done some laundry, meaning he just started it as I'm making my journey home. Yeah. And I would normally be frustrated, like, oh, why can't you not normally, run the like house? Your like past self. Yeah. Yeah. Not today, but my past self. Like, why can't he run the house like I would? And that would mean that like, oh, I need to call while I'm gone to remind him to do the laundry. When really it's like, no, I just need to drop that demand with him. I cannot expect him to do things and spend time with the kids the same way that I would and they actually have so much more fun and they do a better job when I leave Mm. when I let that go yeah I found that a very similar concept 
in my own and I often encourage actually mothers to leave. I'm like, you should leave for a couple days and go do something. Like even my friends, I'm like, go do something that you want to do, like that takes care of you Mm -hmm. in some way. And we run into this almost um, high demand aspect of like, well, but if I leave, then I don't know what's going to happen. And I don't know if he's really going to be all that involved. And Yeah. And I know we've had like Paige and I talk a lot when we're together like this about our marriages and life and we're best friends. So we talk about it. We've both Uh, kind of in this in this past, like I would say year, we've both really been working on like the marriage aspect of not being so controlling in like how our spouse parents our children. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't even have vision viewed it as controlling or labeled it as controlling necessarily either when we started the journey, because I am very specific about how I want my children to experience the world because of my past trauma, right? Like because of my childhood. And so I do everything I do with them or for them for a purpose. It's intentional. Uh Yeah. And so the idea that I could leave and then I wouldn't be able to protect them from something, which is normal in a parent-child relationship. Ruptures are normal. And so for them to have a disagreement or argument with their dad and then need to repair that without my interference is normal and connection building and very important to that father child relationship and how much are you hindering that and we talked about this in the last episode when you're protecting yes or you think you're protecting i yeah i'm actively like protecting them or really i'm just like shielding them from having that and i did notice that it impacted their relationship with their dad Mm -hmm. and i I, this goes back to the nervous system and the stress cycle and so like if you've experienced trauma or if these things make you anxious that is a nervous system reaction and working on your nervous system and regulating yourself can be really helpful because when you're regulated you're able to like rationalize and think through these things and be more aware of like okay i'm wanting to step into this like i want to call and see if they've done laundry or if they've had dinner or if they're going to bed or if you gave sam his medication when really i just need to trust that you're going to do that and if you're regulated it's so much easier so if you need help with that check out our calm mom happy kids class in our resource library it's a really good like beginning step to regulating your regularly closing the stress stress cycle cycle. yeah because that's so important in this because the it is scary especially uh, like with us we come from a place of like the controlling isn't to like be controlling it is a safety controlling is safety yeah and so when i say it there's a lot of like negative connotation with that but that is a way to to keep myself and my kids safe yeah. And I need to recognize that, like, that's not actually a threat in this situation. Yes, exactly. Like, they're going to be okay. Mm-hmm. And I think, too, something else I encourage is kind of that, like, systematic desensitization or, like, exposure therapy where I'm, like, leave. And sit with the anxiety. Yeah, and sit with it. Like, be okay not controlling the schedule or lining the things up and know that it's going to be uncomfortable while you're gone. But then when you get back and things have happened, the children are safe and like we're happy, like that's going to be reaffirming mm-hmm. and it's going to make it easier the next time that you actually let go of the reins mm-hmm. to tr- or drop the demands mm-hmm. and trust that your partner can do that. And I think this is, we talked about human giver syndrome. I think this is a huge part of mm-hmm. it because the expectation is like, I am mom, I will take care of them, I will give up every part of myself and my identity and this is what we're talking about when we are talking about parental burnout it's like you are giving up every part of yourself for your child Mm -hmm. which even saying that i understand society is like yeah that's so honorable that's so great like i can feel that too because that is also how i've been conditioned Mm -hmm. but it is not (gasps) the heater okay sorry we're back the heater came on right when Paige was saying something really good do you remember what you were saying? Yeah. So okay. it's not okay, even though society deems necessary, that you sacrifice everything about yourself in raising your children. It is not actually honorable. It's not some kind of like a stamp of approval. And that is how you lead into parental burnout. And so many of the emotions that you experience, the stress you experience gets stuck in that tunnel. And then we start to have these identity crises. We start to have intense anxiety or intense depression. So being able to, in, I guess, like reflection, drop demands and allow your partner 
to take over helps helps this area of like self preservation, mm-hmm. so you can be okay to continue. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because you're not like really like resting if you're like still doing the thing that you're resting from when you're not like fully pre- like they're doing it. Does that make sense? Yeah. So like, if you're like away and you're still creating these like intense demands and you're still micromanaging your home and your partner's parenting, then you're not actually resting and getting that break. Yes, exactly. And then I would hope also for the same kind of compassion and um, grace from my partner. Mm -hmm. So like if Zane and I have this system, I talk about it all the time where he unloads the dishwasher in the morning and I load it at night. Like, that's how we do it. Mm -hmm. And there are some days where he doesn't unload the dishwasher. It wouldn't be productive for me to be like, well, you didn't unload the dishwasher today. And really, really, like, criticize him for it and criticize his Mm -hmm. character. He also has ADHD. So a lot of it is, in fact, forgetting Mm -hmm. the forgetful aspect of it, out of sight, out of mind. And there are days when I don't want to do the dishes. like Or you forgot to start it. We were in a meeting the other day. Paige works from home on Friday, so we're in a meeting, and I hear Zane, like, going to, like, unload the dishwasher, and Paige had forgotten to start it the night before. Uh Uh-huh. Exactly. Yeah. So, it's like, what would it be like if that was reciprocated, where he was hypercritical of me at that point, Mm -hmm. and now our relationship is deteriorating, because there isn't that, like, area of grace and trust, Mm -hmm. that that flexibility, that it's okay to do things differently. And to not always do it exactly as planned or Mm -hmm. exactly as controlled. Yeah, like things are going to happen. Okay, the next one is reflect on tough situations afterwards. So if you have like a tough parenting moment, and this is the same as like kind of like connecting, communicating, all those things, talking through. um, Or if your partner's parenting in a way you're really uncomfortable with, I think taking some time to regulate and then having a conversation about that. Or Mm -hmm. if a new behavior or a behavior that's really difficult is showing up, taking some time to regulate and then like, okay, what can we do next time this comes up? The next one is tag team, which I love this one. We use this one a lot where if I'm getting to the place where I absolutely cannot (laughs) regulate and contain myself sometimes we will tag team and I'll tap Tim in and you shared a story on I think it was the last episode about Mm -hmm. like homework and how you and Alayla were like having a difficult time and then Zane took over and it was like easy peasy lemon squeezy yeah um and then ways to assess the demands in your co-parenting relationship Really thinking about the why behind the demand, why you feel like your partner needs to do that thing in that way. And then with that, there's usually like an an expectation behind it and then a need. So if I feel like I need my partner to do dinner or bedtime the same way as me, my the expectation or they, okay, the demand would be that they do dinner or bedtime the same way that I do. And the expectation is that you know, things are consistent, that we're on the same page, we agree. And then the need is like, I need to feel validated and supported in my parenting, right? Mm -hmm. So that the need is actually like, I need to feel like you're supporting and validating my parenting experience. So sometimes you can have a conversation and just say that. And then the demand doesn't need to be there because you're getting your need met without placing an expectation on someone else. Yes. This is what I talk about where sometimes feelings just exist Mm -hmm. without the need to fix, change, or resolve something. Mm -hmm. Like sometimes there isn't a demand we need to place on it. There isn't a resolution or something that needs to be done. We just need to be heard. Yes. Which sounds like duh, but like how you have to actually apply that and it's harder than just saying it. Yes. And part of this requires like listening to your partner. And this is like genuine listening, not listening to respond or to tell them why your way of parenting is better and having gentle curiosity with them about why they why their point of view is their point of view because usually there's an expectation and a a need behind it or a why and I referenced this in the last episode when I talked about my own relationship with Tim and that we're both parenting from the same place we're both parenting from a place of wanting what's best for our kids and wanting to raise healthy uh like emotionally stable productive children right Mm -hmm. and um we're just coming about it from a different way and 
he opened up and I don't want to share like his personal stuff, but he opened up about some stuff from his childhood and like growing up and things he's seen that have colored his approach where he's seen people be too, I don't want to say too lenient, but like he feels like there weren't firm boundaries in certain places. And he, that's why he wants to make sure there's firm boundaries in our home. And, and for me, I was like, oh, I totally get that. Mm -hmm. And I see what you're doing now and I'm less defensive about it. So how can we create boundaries in our home in a way that we are both comfortable with? And that had immediately stopped. So it's like, I just needed to take time instead of being defensive to sit down and have a conversation with him and figure out the fear and the need. And some, and sometimes this takes waiting for your partner to be ready to have that conversation and it can be hard. Yeah. Well, and I think too, if we take the time to genuinely listen, not listen to respond, but listen to understand, our goals for our children are very similar. Like you they are, you chose them as your partner for a reason. Mm-hmm. And so while the journey looks different from both perspectives, the end goal is the same. And I would bet that's more often than not when we're discussing this. And I would highly encourage you, and I've really tried to be aware of this myself and like bring it to the forefront of my mind, like in parenting conversations, interactions with Tim, instead of focusing on what I think Tim is doing wrong, <laughs> Um, or like how I would do it differently, trying to figure out why Tim is doing it that way. Oh, yeah. The why. The why. So it's the same thing with your kids. And this is why the low demand parenting, like doing the low demand relationship works really well is because we're trying to figure out why our kids are behaving in this way to understand their needs. You need to do the same thing with your partner. We really just need to do this in all of our relationships, right? And then we can come to a place where we can figure out the problem or the challenge and address it together. Yeah. And one of the phrases I like to use, I always have like a pocket phrase for things to help kind of like trigger my memory of it. It's this phrase I like to say that says, help me understand. Yeah. Or I'm curious about. Uh Uh-huh. Yeah. Help me understand what that means. Yeah. Or help me understand why this is important to you. Yeah. And for me, that's what helps me. Yeah. And I think that this is also a really good way to bring your partner's awareness to things without like making them defensive. So the other day when Sam was throwing his sweatshirt down, Tim was telling him not to throw his sweatshirt. And I was like, I don't really understand that. So later when we talked, I was like, help me understand why you are telling Sam not to throw his sweatshirt. And, and he like thought about it and he was like, I don't even know. I think it was just like a reaction and something that like I wouldn't have been allowed to do. So it just, I was activated and it just came out, but I actually don't care that he's throwing his switch. And I was like, yeah. And and I have parenting moments like that too. So it's good to like reflect on like, and ask yourself in your own parenting, why is this important? Because maybe it's actually not at all important to you. Yeah. There's many a time when I say no or do something and I'm like, actually, it doesn't matter. Yeah. And working with your partner in this way and listening to your partner, I think slowing down is really important, which means like not coming into conversations activated. This is the nervous system regulation piece, Mm -hmm. giving time and space so that you're not like full mama bear when you're trying to understand your partner. Circle Uh, back one more time to our Calm Mom Happy Kids course for that. Yes. And then something that's also really important is stating your own why and your own needs. So when you're talking to your spouse about why you're parenting the way you are and why you feel it's important, sharing. So like, okay, an example from the book was she would allow screens at dinner and she didn't really place the demand that everyone sit at the table and eat together. Mm. And her husband would get a little more rigid with this. And she was able to explain that by the end of the day, being the default parent, she's exhausted and she doesn't have the energy to enforce another demand. And so in order to preserve her own regulation, and this is so important in low demand parenting, especially if you are neurodivergent and she is in the book. This is why I love this book is because it's about being a neurodivergent parent parenting neurodivergent kids. Mm -hmm. And once she explained that to her husband, he totally got it. He was like, oh, I get it. What can I do to make dinner time easier for you? Or how can we create a system for when you're too burnt out to, you know? And so, and for me, we talked about last night, Mm -hmm. same thing. By dinner time, I'm wrecked. 
And so I am not in the mood to try and encourage my kids to eat new things. Yeah. So literally there are some nights where they just pick what they want and I make it for them. And Tim used to get a little frustrated by this. Like, why are you making them three different meals? And I had to say, like, it's actually easier for me. Like, I know, and thank you for being concerned that you're putting more work on me. But by the end of the day, I don't have the capacity to, like, co-regulate with them while they try new things. And so that's something we need to do on the weekends. And he was like, oh, cool, get it. And then we've never had to have that conversation again. Yep, exactly. And so stating your own needs and your why instead of just the expectation or the demand. Exactly. And I ran into that same thing. On Friday night, like I told you after I mentioned before, we had the whole pee in the car incident. And by then I was like wrecked. I was already exhausted. I had worked um, probably an extra 10 hours last week than I normally do. And mm-hmm. I hadn't had a chance to recover. And so it was just so high demand that by the end of the day, I called Zane and I was like, yeah, I'm just really tired. And so it's kind of a fend for yourself night. Like I'm not going to be doing anything. Like, I'm not doing the dishes. I'm not making a fresh dinner. Like, the kids will be fed and I will get them in bed. But, like, we're just going to watch movies and hang out. Like, we're calling it. Yeah. 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 And I think that's where that, like, communication piece. And if you explain the why, your partner's more likely to understand and the need, right? And then the last tip is to get creative and drop demands of your partner with your own self-care. And so I think some of this is, like, okay, I, this is the example. I feel like if I need to go out of town, I'm anxious about that and all of these different things. Well, yeah. what ways can you creatively get your rest time without having to place demands on your partner? And maybe it's, you know, sitting with the anxiety. Maybe it's taking time for yourself while you're, if your spouse is working a lot, like after the kids go to bed and setting up a very intentional like spa night or yeah. for me, it's been like going to the gym. So like I don't have a lot of time away from my kids outside of work. And what I started to recognize the the end of last year is that I love my kids. I love spending time with them, but I need more time regularly away from them. But Tim works a lot. Mm -hmm. And so for me getting creative, it was like, okay, well, if I go to the gym in the morning, I get an hour to myself. I get to socialize with the people at my workout class. And that's my way of like meeting other needs in my self-care. So there are creative ways to work that in and meet your own needs without expecting more of your partner. And a lot of that involves regulating your nervous system and just being okay with whatever happens when you're taking that time. Yeah, exactly. And it it varies, of course, depending on what you need and what your life allows. So I think a lot of the feedback we get online is like, wow, that really sounds like you have a lot of privilege. And like, yes, I acknowledge the privilege that I have Mm -hmm. to have a gym membership, to be able to have a partner where I can go to the gym in the mornings, etc. But also there are ways to do a trial and error to weave things into your day to help care for you. Well, okay, let's use the example of like you dropping the demands at home, right? Mm -hmm. So like if you place the demand on yourself that we have a sit down dinner on Friday night, that's a fresh meal and I do my normal routine, um, that's meaning that like you're going to be frustrated or you're expecting Zane to be home to help support you in that. And that's adding a demand on him because that's not a role he normally takes because he works a swing shift. It's a whole thing. Okay. So, um, but a way to get creative, Paige did. She said, okay, my needs right now, I'm not going to be able to function. And it's going to be a shit show if Mm -hmm. I try and push through this. So the kids are having it's scrounge night or leftover night, which kids probably love. And then you're taking the demand off yourself to meet your own needs. And so it's a little bit of that, like really looking at the areas where you can let go of demands you place on yourself. Yes, exactly. And I, I, it's a beautiful way to state it because I think oftentimes that's how I ch- choose, chose to Cho- look at parenting chosen? in a chosen. Mm, I don't even know. But okay. parenting in that perspective of like, what can I handle? Because I can't control anyone around me. I can't control how Zane does it or even what space he's going to be in and his availability. So what do I have the capacity for? What feels realistic for me and how can I make that work? And I know you've done a lot of that. Like we, we talked through a lot of that, like on weekends, mm-hmm. you like Paige is very intentional going into her weekend. She's like this weekend, I'm feeling like I need a lot of rest. And so I'm going like, th- this is my plan. 
again, or Mm -hmm. this week's busy coming up. So I feel like I need to like prep for that or whatever it Mm -hmm. is. So it really just takes like being intentional, asking what you need, and then adjusting your life instead of expecting your partner. And I, I know this is hard, but to like rise up to meet your demands. Yeah, exactly. So we're talking about how we're out of town this weekend. Every Sunday we do our Sunday reset, which I know your family yeah. does something similar yeah. where as a family, we clean the house and the kids clean the room and we put away the folded laundry, etc. Like I don't have an expectation that that's going to be gone because I am part of that team mm-hmm. at home and I'm not there. It's not that I lead it or I'm the only one that does it. But I also don't expect it to be happening. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm not going to come home and then be angry that we haven't done the Sunday reset. Mm-hmm. I already acknowledge, like we said, that this weekend was going to be busy because we're here working. Mm-hmm. And then next week, I have to move right into work. So I have already realized that I can have a very high demand week for an extended period of time. But how that's going to leave me and leave me participating in the relationship with my children and husband is not the person that I want to be. Mm-hmm. I will burn myself out. Mm-hmm. And so I've already like thought about all the different ways that I can lower demands for the next week, week and a half. Share some of them. So I have already like thought of the crock pot meals mm-hmm. instead of having to stand in the kitchen and cook. Because if I'm not working a late night, I really enjoy cooking. That's like a self-care thing for me. Um, but knowing that it, it would be high demand... Right now, because I'm going to be working more hours than normal, I'm going to have a short period of time where I would where I would immediately come home and then I would have to cook and then I'd have to go like carpool the kids to their activities and then come home. Mm-hmm. And so I decided that I was going to do a crock pot meal every day this week mm-hmm. and leftovers. Mm-hmm. So that way it's just available and ready when the kids get home from school and I don't have to do anything extra mm-hmm. to make sure that we're fed. Mm-hmm. And that time and space in between, I can sit in my recliner and have my warm cup of coffee that I love to do because that's one of the regulating things for me is just to like sit and be mm-hmm. and have a warm cup of coffee and it's like three in the afternoon but I'm gonna live my life people don't come at me so that's one of them mm-hmm. another one was letting go of those expectations because I'm coming here this weekend instead of being home to rest and rejuvenate and do the laundry and clean up so like I've Normally wouldn't, but I've been sleeping on my bed without sheets on it because Mm -hmm. they were in the dryer and I didn't have the capacity to fold them. Mm -hmm. Like knowing that we're going to be pulling clean clothes out of the laundry baskets this week because Mm -hmm. we haven't had a chance to like sort Mm -hmm. through anything. Like being okay with all of those aspects of things just getting done when they get done versus like an expectation on myself or a demand on myself of Mm -hmm. when they need to be completed. Mm -hmm. And that mindset shift is life changing, guys. Mm -hmm. Like recognizing that like this is not permanent like it's okay yes and having the awareness that if I push myself to hold myself to the expectation that I had when I had more capacity on weeks I'm not working as much I will damage myself Mm -hmm. Uh, like I will be really really stressed and very exhausted and Mm -hmm. I don't like to feel that way yes love it well thanks for tuning in and we will see you next week Thanks for coming to Mindful as a Mother podcast. If you'd like more of us and Mindful as a Mother, you can find Paige at Instagram at Parenting with Paige and Lindsay at Linz underscore Adams LCSW. Find us on TikTok, Instagram, and in our Facebook group, creating community and smashing parental stigma, embracing mindful motherhood and positive parenting. Thanks so much and see you next time.